All righty, gang. Thank you so much for coming tonight to Cal Matters. I'm Kristen Go. I'm the editor in chief of Cal Matters. And for those of you who are new to Cal Matters, we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit um, news organization. And we launched a little more than eight years ago. And we launched with just a handful of people with the idea that there was not the kind of coverage in California's capital that there needed to be. Now we have people all over the state. Um, and so we're really excited to have you here. Today we're going to talk about the um, about what to expect in 2024 in California politics. Um, and we have our great politics team here to speak with you. We have Samia Kamal, and then we have Alexi Kosef. And we could not do this without the uh, great support of our partners, Lucas Public Affairs. So thank you very much to them for supporting us today. And we're going to go ahead and dive right in. Um, you know, last week, the Legislative Analyst Office, maybe they knew we were going to have this panel. I'm not sure. <laughs> But they said that, you know, they're expecting a $68 billion deficit. So, Alexi, you said in your story, one of your sources said, it's not a quote-unquote crisis. So what is it? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely not good. It's definitely not good. Um, I, think, I think the term they used was serious problem. And uh, undoubtedly, it is going to be the issue that hangs over all of next year, uh, at least until, you know, July when the new fiscal year starts and there has to be a plan in place for dealing with this and potentially longer if state revenues continue to collapse. I mean, the fundamental issue here is that the California economy has been hit a lot harder than many other states by some of these economic issues over the past year, including a weakening stock market, because California is so dependent on the wealthiest taxpayers who get a lot of their income uh, from capital gains and things like that. Um, the inflation has hit the housing market hard. Uh, unemployment is up slightly because hiring, uh, businesses are, are pinched and hiring is down. I mean, all these factors, right? So um, suddenly all these grand plans that the state has been putting into place over the last couple of years are called into question. And uh, what the financial officials in the state so far are saying is that they can deal with this immediate problem without taking, you know, ma making major cuts to essential state programs. But the state is going to have to revisit some of the commitments that it's made in the past few years for some of these sort of one-time programs that um, were put into place around the environment, transit, other issues like that. Um, dipping into reserves that have been building over the past decade or so and taking other, you know, significant steps to get the financial house in order. So undoubtedly that's just going to be the issue that is, is dominating all the conversations in the early part of, or most of next year probably. So, yeah. So one of the questions is with this deficit, will we see any changes to the health care minimum wage law that was passed this year. The Department of Finance said it could cost the state $4 billion um, for 24-25. And, you know, Newsom has said, we need to revisit this, um, and especially at this time. So what might that look like? Yeah, I mean, there's always been... So this was a law that was passed uh, right at the end of the last legislative session, and it will gradually raise the minimum wage for all workers at healthcare facilities to at least $25 per hour over the next couple of years. Now, this is not just the folks you're thinking of, the doctors, the nurses. Th those are the people making far more than $25 per hour already. We're talking about the custodians, the gift shop employees. I mean, people um, that, that you might not even realize would fall under the healthcare workers kind of label. So, um, you know, this was a big victory for organized labor, one of their priorities last year, and it came down to the wire whether or not Newsom was going to sign it. It was the very last night. I remember a Friday night. We were all waiting to see what he would do. Um, 
And I think it's been very clear from that that there was always some hesitation and some questions about whether this was something he was fully on board with. So it's not surprising to hear now, especially that, you know, he's trying to reopen sort of those negotiations and, and figure out are can they delay the runway of how long this is going to take or, um, you know, phase it in over a longer period of time, things like that. Uh Obviously, once the law is already in place, the momentum is kind of on the side of, of the law. So that's that's a hard thing now, right? But um, when you're the governor, you do you do certainly get a lot of say in those negotiations. So um, certainly you're going to see probably some tension back and forth between those who fought really hard to get this law in place and are going to want to defend it now, and then the administration, which is looking out for the bottom line of the state. So you mentioned kind of the role that labor played in getting the health care minimum wage law passed. Uh, I don't think this is any surprise to any of you, hot labor summer. Um, we heard a lot about that and about just how active um, unions were in the, in, in the legislature over the past session. What can we expect to see next year? Um. I think one of the things we saw last year was the, the veto of the um, unemployment pay for striking workers, and I think that's a shift that maybe we'll see this year because the, the environment, the temperature at the time was very hot. Um, it was happening amidst you know, the actors and the writer's strike, and it had been you know, hundreds of days into that. Um, so I think that's something that we'll be looking out for is whether that resurfaces, um, but also how the environment around it has changed. Um, I think just also, you know, there's a complete shift in momentum around what's possible in the capital. And this can be an issue for every group that's out there. I mean, uh, organized labor had a really, really successful year last year in terms of getting a lot of their priorities through the legislature that even some that had, they had tried multiple times and not been able to get through before. The governor didn't sign all of those, but I think there was a certain sense of momentum that we're going to come back and try again next year and build on these victories. And now you're looking at a situation where anything that costs even a little bit of money is just going to have an immense amount of scrutiny around it that it didn't have even just a few months ago. And so the world of possibility of what might get through the legislature has shrunk dramatically just overnight, basically. So since that's shrunk dramatically, what are some of the key issues that we're going to see this year or next year, technically? I mean, one thing that we're already seeing lawmakers uh, say they want to do introduce bills around is artificial intelligence. Unsurprising probably to everyone, just the absolute explosion in interest and the lack of regulation around AI has gotten everybody very nervous. Um, so I would expect, you know, a ton of bills to be introduced and then also a lot of money being spent lobbying to try and prevent some of those. Um, you know, the industry is going to try and keep things as open as possible in order to be able to, you know, develop this new technology without a huge framework of regulations around it. And I think there's a lot of nerves over there. Um, you know, we're already seeing people talk about trying to put restrictions on the use of AI in political ads, in, uh, you know, gosh, just like all kinds of things, right? I mean, there's, they, they can each introduce like 40 or 50 bills. So there's lots of ideas out there. And um, uh, other things I'm hearing about already, I mean, there's still a lot of interest in um, taking on the fentanyl crisis. Um, that was a huge source of tension at the Capitol last year. There were a lot of bills introduced, and it kind of came to a head because a lot of more progressive Democratic lawmakers did not want to pass these bills that increase penalties around fentanyl use and fentanyl dealing because it goes counter to what's been a trend of trying to repeal that kind of tough on crime approach of, of previous decades. And it seems like the public sentiment has shifted so much around that, that there's a, a real renewed push to introduce even more legislation around that. And we saw um, the governor announce even just last week that he's actually going to seek a bill to increase penalties around a new emerging drug known as Trank. So definitely a lot more, um, definitely a lot more bills around just 
crime uh, or criminal penalties for, for drug trafficking, drug dealing, things like that. I think going into an election year, just crime bills generally, we already have some select committees on retail theft, car thefts that are um, due to begin in the new year. Um, the uninsurance um, issue that uh, we the legislature wasn't able to deal with last year, they're planning to pick that back up again. And Alexi, I think you reported more on that. Last yeah, year. I mean, uh, you know, obviously this the home insurance market has really been... Um, well, I don't want to say collapsing, but in some parts of the state, it really is getting to that point where it's almost impossible to find private insurance for for a homeowner because of the wildfire risk. And the state did try and come to an agreement at the end of the last legislative session, something that they could do to lower liabilities for home insurance companies and keep them in the state market. They were not able to come to an agreement. And uh, the state... Uh, insurance commissioner actually introduced some regulations, but those are going to take at least a year or two in order to finalize. So there will be continued pressure on the legislature to act in that space as well. I think that's an issue that we're seeing here. It's a huge issue in Texas. It's a huge issue in Florida. Is anybody getting this right right now? Does anybody have any good solutions? I think it probably depends on what side you're coming from. I mean, what what the home insur what the home insurance companies are saying is basically they have particular issues with California because there are there's a very strict process for approving increases to uh, to uh, insurance rates, and uh, meanwhile they're not allowed to take into account sort of their projections for how bad things are going to get from wildfires. They can only take into account, account past losses. So they want to change how the whole system is calculated, and that has the consumer groups really, really concerned. So I think if you ask the consumer groups, they'd say, well, actually, we have it right here in California. <laughs> and the insurance companies would probably point to states where there's a lot less regulation and a lot more ability to sort of use these models that are are trying to account for climate change and all of these factors that are, you know, really making it more dangerous to build homes in certain parts of the state. So we talked about some of the different priorities we're going to see. What are some things that aren't being discussed that maybe should? Um, one thing that I think we heard a lot about last year was public transit. I think that's going to, I mean... Um, the, the issue has not been resolved, but uh, the budget situation is not there. So I think um, I expect we'll see continued push from Bay Area legislators, especially who have, you know, formed committees to tackle, you know, a possible um, uh, bond measure for 2026 for which they would need to pass a bill next year. Um, and then there's also, you know, I've been talking and tapping into different communities and what they're concerned with. Um, just last week, uh, Senator Dave Min held a roundtable with different Asian American Pacific Islander communities, and he was talking a little bit about the legislative shakeup and um, how there are new committee leaders, including on the Budget Committee. Um, and so uh, the Assembly Budget Committee no longer has Phil Ting as its chair. Um, so they were talking about, you know, we've had this champion in the Budget Committee for our issues. And in 2021, the state invested, I think, for the first time, um, $156 million in, in um, efforts to combat anti-Asian hate um, after the COVID pandemic. So um, things like that, that, you know, the state could do during a surplus, um, I think is going to be difficult moving forward. Um, yeah, that's that's one of the things that comes to mind. You know, we, the the legislature that was, that, that you know, this past legislature has been the most representative legislature of California in terms of the number of women, the number of people of color. Have we seen that reflected in the policies and in terms of the legislation? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, some of the lawmakers I've talked to recently talk about how that um, the intersectionality of that with labor, with housing issues, like it's not just like you put a bill for a specific community. It's like you're dealing with it through the 
you know, the economic infrastructure through all these different policies, through social welfare. Um, and so I think uh, how well the state sustains those programs and the budget is going to um, show us more about that. But also the thing that we hear a lot about in representation is leadership. Um, and so, you know, the more that we have not just to diverse lawmakers, but diverse lawmakers in positions of power as, you know, committee chairs. Um, and so with the recent shakeup, for example, we did, um, I think there were, um, fewer uh, lawmakers of color in the highest positions of the assembly. So it's something that I, you know, I will be keeping an eye out on in the coming year, how that affects specific policy. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, we have a little election that's gonna come up uh, next year. And one of the biggest ones that a lot of people are watching, not just here, but nationwide, is um, the US Senate. So what do we expect to happen there? Yeah, I mean, this is, it's kind of exciting. We haven't had a real competitive, high-profile Senate race like this in a long time. Every time there seems to come a seat open, something gets in the way. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens here. Obviously, we know that generally California, it's almost certain at this point a Democrat is going to be elected, but there are you know, several very high profile Democratic members of Congress who are running for this seat, Adam Schiff, Katie Porter, Barbara Lee, all mounting serious campaigns. And, you know, the question is, are two of them going to make it through to the top two? Or will there be one of these Republican uh, opponents who uh, emerges as a stronger contender and makes it so that essentially this is decided in the primary? Um, what we're seeing right now with the polling suggests that both Adam Schiff and Katie Porter are going to make it through to the November election, in which case it becomes a very interesting race in a whole different way. You know, do Republicans just not bother to vote? Do, you know, does one of them sort of moderate to the middle to try and win over those voters? I mean, there's all kinds of dynamics that could be playing out in the future around that. But right now, I think um, the Republican Party is trying to sort of coalesce voters around um, potentially Steve Garvey, the former Los Angeles Dodger, Dodgers baseball player who's running but has run a very, very low-profile campaign so far, essentially not existent in public um, and kind of just running on name ID at the moment, um, trying to push him through to the top two so that they have some representation on that November ballot that, you know, make – because if there's nobody there at the top of the ticket, essentially for Republicans, it could hurt down ballot races in, in the House and things like that. So, you know, there's all kinds of interesting dynamics that we're going to see play out in March. But um, it looks right now like it, it could end up being two Democrats. I mean, you've done some reporting on this, and, and I'm, I'm curious to see, you know, we've seen a little of this already, but how the war in Gaza is impacting this race in particular. Yeah, like Alexi said, um, you know, the Democratic candidates especially are really having to differentiate themselves from each other. Um, I think there was a triple labor foundation, uh, you know, endorsement. So they're, they're all pro-labor. They all, you know, they're all Democrats. They all have so much in common. So um, uh, I do think this issue uh, in particular has differentiated Barbara Lee, who has been the only um, candidate to call for a ceasefire. Um, and I, I think in you know, the Senate race in particular, there's been a lot of activism on both sides and it's been at the city level and the state level, but really where um, I think people understand that there's more impact is these national, you know, whether it's the Senate race or congressional seats. Um, so yeah, between um, Adam, well, interestingly on Monday, um, the mayor of the city of Burbank shifted his endorsement from Adam Schiff, who represents Burbank as part of his house district to Barbara Lee um, over, you know, their stances on this. So I do think it's going to be something that we continue to see shaping um, not just the Senate race, but other congressional races as well. Also happening in March, little primary election. Um, there's only one ballot proposition on the March ballot. Tell us a little bit more about that and why. That this was a very intentional move. Uh, the the in March voters will be voting on a measure that Gavin Newsom has crafted 
to redistribute how some healthcare funding is spent in California. There's a millionaire's tax that for two decades now has been used to fund essentially behavioral health services in counties across the state. And Gavin Newsom wants to shift about a third of that money into uh, more residential treatment, um, help build out the beds and, uh, you know, both temporary and permanent beds for people to get mental health treatment. Um, things that he said will be really essential for dealing with our homelessness issue because so many of the people that are out on the streets right now uh, have mental health issues and are not able to take care of themselves. So he cleared the way for this to go onto the ballot and um, and wanted to make it be sort of the only thing that voters are focused on and the only kind of question they have to decide. Oftentimes we see these really crowded ballots where there's all sorts of stuff kind of competing for attention. Um, and this is an interesting one because actually just in the past few days we've seen both labor and business groups come out and endorse this measure, which I think will be Proposition 1. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's the governor sort of flexing his political muscle, um, bringing people on his side, and uh, really trying to push through a kind of signature change to the system so that he can tell voters, I did something, I helped address homelessness in California, which by all accounts is the number one issue that people are worried about these days in public polling. And there's a lot at stake. I mean, California leads the nation in terms of the number of homeless people. Um, you know, this is supposed to be the first major overhaul of the mental health system in 20 years. But this isn't a slam dunk because it's not endorsed by everyone. There are some last minute amendments that would um, that opponents worry will will lead to more involuntary treatment. Um, so, you know, where do you expect to see more opposition coming from? This is the perpetual source of tension in how we deal with mental health in California. Uh, you know, there are people who are very concerned about civil liberties and in making sure that people continue to have the ability to make decisions for how they want to be treated and whether they want to seek treatment at all. And there are those who are pushing on the other side, you know, saying these people are not healthy enough to make decisions for themselves. And at some point we need to intervene and push more people into treatment. Gavin Newsom is ultimately at this point coming in down more on that side of pushing more people into treatment. And that's causing, you know, that's causing this blowback from disability rights groups and others who feel like, you know, they are, their, you know, the rights of, of people could be taken away in the process. Um, you're also seeing, you know, county me, uh, behavioral health um, you know, departments uh, pushing back because they're going to lose potentially about a third of their funding through this process. That money is going to be redirected toward this behavioral um, and mental health housing, and that's less money for the services that they provide daily for people. So, you know, they are going up against a lot of money and, you know, power and influence on, on one side. It remains to be seen whether their voice will ultimately convince a lot of voters to, to reject this measure. But, uh, you know, it, it is not a slam dunk, as you said. The last time that, that Gavin Newsom put one of his priorities on the ballot um, four years ago in 2020, a school bond measure, it actually narrowly failed despite not having any organized opposition. So when it comes to money and how we spend it, weird things can always happen with, with elections. So you talked about Newsom's political capital. There is a little, you know, red state, blue state debate that happened. Some of you may or may not have watched it. Um, but, you know, he, he did that debate on Fox. Um, he has traveled to, he traveled to Israel um, and changed plans on his way to China. You know, this is not, um, this is, this is somebody who has, who's gaining more of a national profile and he is termed out. So what do we expect to see out of Gavin? Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that, you know, the question now is whether Gavin Newsom's going to run for president and how he's positioned himself for that. Um, I think you can see very clearly, uh, you know, it's not just about having that national profile, but in what capacity. So the China trip 
was an interesting one. For example, he was the first governor to go visit China from the, the first U.S. governor to go visit China in four years, basically, since before the pandemic, right? And that allows him to go out there, burnish his foreign policy credentials, and also be seen as a leader on climate change. So you could imagine, okay, in a hypothetical Democratic primary in the future, this is a guy who's going to want to be out there saying, I was a leader on climate change, right? Um, I think, you know, the, the Fox News debate is interesting because it gives him an opportunity to go out there and get a little bit of practice on the stuff where he's going to get hit in the future if, if he does run uh, in a primary, potentially, right? So he gets to work on his arguments around homelessness, around poverty, around all these things that we saw that, you know, um, that that Sean Hannity had, had plenty of questions about where the state isn't doing so well. So, uh, you know, he's, he's getting out there, he's putting in the reps, and uh, we'll see whether he, uh, he, uh, he does run or not. I think it's interesting to see how that translates into his policy decisions in California. Um, some of his big bill vetoes, um, I think, drew some eye raised some eyebrows about whether that was part of his effort to, um, you know, polish or, or slightly tweak his image on the national stage. Um, in one of the bills I reported on last year was the caste discrimination bill, which would have. Um, um, added that to uh, the different classes of, you know, um, discrimination in employment, housing laws. And so it was kind of a surprising veto, given that California prides itself on being a leader on civil rights issues. Um, but, you know, when you're trying to possibly build your, your brand nationally, I think there are more competing interests. And, you know, I think we saw in a San Francisco Chronicle article that there was a, a donor, not even from California, who had kind of, you know, um, uh, nudged him to say no a bit. So, you know, I think we might see possibly more of that in the coming year. I did skip ahead when I asked a little bit about Newsom. I want to come back to what we're going to see. We talked about March. Not a lot on the ballot in March, but definitely a lot for November. Um, you know, there are several propositions that are already vying for play right now. Let's talk a little bit about some of those propositions and what we expect to see. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot that's out there right now collecting signatures, trying to qualify for November, but, you know, already there's some carryover stuff from previous years that has already, that's already eligible. So we could be seeing a very, very crowded ballot in November. Some of the stuff that you can definitely expect to see there, there's going to be a referendum on um, setbacks around oil wells. There's going to be another minimum wage increase initiative. There's going to be a measure to asking to increase taxes to put in a fund for preparing for future pandemics. There's going to be a, uh, uh, gosh, there's already like seven or eight that are on there. Um, I was trying to remember if there's a dialysis measure. <laughs> not yet. Not, I, I know, but there is another rent control. Uh, there's measure. time for that one. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so there, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there already and we're seeing, um, you know, we're seeing stuff circulating now. Uh, actually, uh, one of the most interesting fights is likely to be around a measure that, uh, would make it harder to raise local taxes. Um, this is something that we've seen before. Uh, when Jerry Brown was governor, there was um, a group that qualified a measure. It was largely funded by the uh, the soda com the soda industry, and they ended up coming to a deal to pull that from the ballot if the state. Uh, prevented for a, a full decade any local cities or counties from passing their own soda taxes. So these things, sometimes there's sort of a ulterior motive at play, something that people are really after. And um, that deal enraged a lot of lawmakers and they don't want to make a similar kind of deal this time around. So they actually passed a measure at the end of the last legislative session to try and make it harder to pass that measure that would make it harder to pass new taxes. So there's all this kind of back and forth fighting that's happening and and some of that could end up on the November ballot as well. So no last minute deal to take that. There's still time. So they, they until June, there could still be a deal, but in the meantime, lots of nudging each other back and forth. <laughs> so, you know, what are also some of the, hot races we're expecting. Um, we heard 
well, I think it was just last week, Kevin McCarthy. Um, and there are, we, we did a story talking about who's in, who's out. It's kind of hard to keep track of that one, but that's not the only hot race. So let's talk about some of those races. Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of longtime California members of the California delegation to Congress that are stepping down, Kevin McCarthy, Anna Eshoo, there's will be some seats opening up with Katie Porter, Adam Schiff, and Barbara Lee running for uh, for Senate. They're all giving up those seats. So um, a lot of these seats, especially now, are either safely Republican or safely Democratic. If you win that seat, you're basically guaranteed as long as you want, you know, in Congress. And so a ton of people are jumping in. Uh, I think the Anna Eshoo one is a really interesting one. It was only a few weeks ago that she announced that she was retiring after almost 30 years in Congress, and already I think half a dozen people have jumped into that race, have raised hundreds of thousands of dollars already. I mean, it's going to be a really, you know, competitive a uh, race, a very expensive one too. I mean, that's in, uh, in this. If that's in Silicon Valley. There's a ton of money there, um, and uh, the the Adam Schiff seat as well. I think there's something like eight or nine Democrats all running for that seat, which is very heavily Democratic district. So, if one of them gets through in March, the race is basically over. If two of them get through in March, it's going to be a slugfest in November. So, yeah, a lot of really interesting things happening in, in the congressional races. All right, we are going to open it up for questions. So we've got a microphone. If you guys have a question, please raise your hand. Hi. Well, thank you for this, first of all. Really interesting. Um, I'm curious what your reporters are hearing about bond discussions in the Capitol. We have a clim potential climate bonds, education, housing. What's the latest uh, scuttlebutt on that? Yeah, there were, uh, there were a bunch that lawmakers were trying to pass at the end of last session, and there had been sort of this uh, message down from the governor essentially we can we can't put more than about twenty six billion dollars in bonds on the ballot next year. That's all that we have the capacity to take on at this point as a state. And it kind of put the brakes on. There were there was one for higher ed, one for K twelve, one for housing, uh, and I think you know there was an effort to have everyone come together and decide what is the legislature going to move forward this coming year. Well, obviously now we're in an entirely different financial situation again. So I think everyone's going to sort of have to recalculate what, what's that number? What can they actually uh, afford to put on the ballot? And also is there voter appetite? I think that's another factor here, you know, that we might see play out with this bond measure that Gavin Newsom has on, the ballot in March. Um, I, I did neglect to mention it's not just it's not just uh, diverting some of the money from the millionaires' tax. There's also there's a bond piece as well. So, if voters are feeling really down on the the financial direction that the state is headed, and they're not willing to pass this priority of new sums, there's probably going to be a lot less momentum in the legislature next year to be able to put some of these other priorities onto the November ballot. So. You know, it's a question. I'm sure they all would love to pass a bunch of bonds so that we can they can get around the fact that there's less tax revenue. Uh, but you know, it's partly dependent on the mood of the electorate as well. Thank you so much for the time today. Um, I have two short questions. One being, what have we seen on uh, updates about the, de the Delta Tunnel Project? Um, I know that that was a very contentious issue, and would love to hear your insights as to where you see us moving with that conversation. And second, you touched on it a little bit, but I'm curious how you've seen Californians' uh, sentiments change on the uh, Israel-Palestine uh, uh, conflict happening in Gaza. Um, I know we've seen things shift federally with congressional representatives, especially in the House, uh, now supporting a ceasefire. The UN, as of yesterday, uh, had su supported the ceasefire as well, and how you see Californians uh, shifting on that issue. 
All right. Well, I, I wish I was more of an expert on the on the Delta Tunnel situation. I'll try and take that though. Um, I know that, you know, uh, Newsom has embraced the project as it was modified into a slightly smaller project from two tunnels to one. So it does have the backing of the state and, you know, there's a continued push forward. Uh, I think it was just yesterday, right, that uh, they got this final environmental impact report and this and Newsom, you know, made a big deal about that, right? He was really touting that this is something now that he is trying to put his stamp on. So in terms of, I mean, that that project will be going on long after he's in office, which, you know, means that he's not, um, you know, it's not it's not just going to be up to him. But I think having his support, having uh, him pushing it forward, is is certainly helping things along. There was also some legislation through the budget last year that did kind of streamline some of the uh, environmental requirements for big infrastructure projects with a specific. Um, I to the Delta Tunnel project in some of that um, that could help clear the way, but there are still lots of legal fights I believe to be had. Um, certainly, and there are environmental groups and groups in Northern California that are very worried about losing that water and are not going to just you know step aside and allow it to happen. So, you know, that was a big moment for the for the project, but yeah, there's still a lot a lot left to go there. On your second question, which you said was a short question, but I think that could be a whole panel of its own. Um, <laughs> um, well, I, I think, um, you know, what you kind of hit on was there's the public sentiment and then there's the way that, you know, state leaders have responded or are trying to figure out how to respond. And I think um, it's, you know, a situation that is changing from, you know, what happened on October 7th to what has happened since then. And um, I think it's been um, a matter of how are how are state leaders monitoring the response to October seventh to Hamas's attack, um, and how you know um, how appropriate is the response? I think there is also you know um, somewhat of a of a numbers game in terms of. Um, how people feel about it, you know, the um, Public Policy Institute of California did a poll about um, how do likely voters feel about the issue, and 60% um, of likely voters said that, the, you know, the U.S. should stay neutral. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, it's tricky ground for lawmakers who don't want to isolate any communities, especially in California when um, Gavin Newsom was going to, uh, making his last minute trip to Israel on his way to China, he did say that part of why he was going was California is home to the, um, the was it the second largest Jewish population in the U.S. and um, one of the largest Arab American populations in the U.S. And so there are these like two communities that are, you know, deeply in pain in different ways. And um, I, I think it's also, I think I hear a lot about it being painted as kind of like a generational divide or like a you know, possibly like fringe movement, I think that could be a political mistake because I think um, the uh, there's a lot of efforts, there's a lot of movement, there's campaigns happening in like Southern California, especially targeting specific congressional seats to like either calling on the, um, these lawmakers to uh, call for a ceasefire or they will try to vote you out. So um, yeah, I, I think there's still a divide between public sentiment and how the state is responding if that answers your question. You know, Samia, you did some really good reporting talking about how, you know, there are the, the pro-Palestinian um, supporters really do feel like they have been completely ignored by state leaders. Can you talk a little bit about some of what they told you for those who aren't able to read your story? Sure, yeah. I mean, some of it is just um, history. There is no, for example, on the census, Arab Americans are not counted as a separate uh, community. Um, they are often either... Uh, don't answer or, um, you know, or, or they're counted as white. So um, the community has been underfunded and politically unrepresented because um, there's no sort of like separate outreach for their community's needs in California. That's despite, you know, we're seeing more increased political engagement. Um, there was Little Arabia designated in Orange County, um, which like if you have uh, been around Orange County, it was always kind of Little Arabia. And so it like 
you know, that, that designation um, kind of took a while officially. Um, but I think what I, what I heard a lot from people was just um, somewhat of what we see nationally, for example, in Michigan, you know, um, where Democratic politicians really courted the Arab community on different issues. And when it was between Biden and Trump, um, they, uh, you know, sort of saw the, the, <laughs> the benefit in voting for Biden. But now that, you know, they're like, hey, we voted you in, you know, like, are you going to speak for us now? And that, um, that response hasn't been there. Um, so I think that's, you know, what we're seeing nationally as well as in California. Hi. You, you three are fabulous, and thank you. And thank you, Cal Matters, and thank you, Donna Lucas, for the wine. The, uh, to, to, uh, you hit on all the points. <laughs> <laughs> too, too quick. Is there a final deadline for the legislature pl pr placing something on the November ballot? What is it? Do you know, please? Yes, it's... it's uh, like something like June twenty fifth, somewhere around the end of June. I don't, I don't know how you know the exact date, but um, so yeah, that deadline. It's not just the deadline to put stuff on the ballot, but it's also actually a deadline to take stuff off. As we've seen increasingly in recent years, interest groups come together, make a deal on some contentious issue that you know averts a bit an expensive ballot fight. So that's when you know what I'm talking about sort of the potential for a deal to remove that tax measure that is that same deadline at the end of June that's good to know and that's unfortunate about taking them off the ballot the uh, uh, second question please there's street talk of a potential statewide bond movement tied to a requirement that there be personal finance class in high school have you picked it have you heard anything about this it's one of the ones that's collecting signatures I don't think it's a bond measure I think it's just it's an initiative that would require all students to take uh, essentially like a financial literacy class as part of their graduation requirement. I believe um, it's a, the group behind it is a group that offers free financial literacy courses or something like that. So it's a little bit of a, you know, I mean, there's potentially some public good in there, but there's also a little bit of potentially self-serving aspect to it too. So, um, you know, uh, that's one of the many that's collecting signatures and could be on November. I mean, uh, there's a, there's other stuff that we didn't mention around, uh, for example, the rights of transgender youth. There's a couple measures that are circulating that could restrict, you know, their ability to play uh, high school sports or get, um, like, gender you know, transitional care, things like that. Um, so there's a lot of stuff out there that's collecting signatures right now. Um, the deadline for those is the similar. It's the end of June, but that means that they need to turn in the signatures to be counted a couple of months before that. So they're kind of in the end stages almost right now. They've probably just got a couple more months early spring, and then they've got to turn stuff in to get the signatures verified. So Definitely keep an eye out. There's going to be a lot of people approaching you at the grocery store trying to get you to sign stuff in the next couple of months. Thank you. That's the PSA that we're giving all of you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a comment and, and a question. Um, one thing I would add on the Proposition 1 to what you've already said about the initiative is that it changes the name of the Mental Health Services Act to the Behavioral Health Services Act and allows for the funding to be used to treat people with substance use disorders, even whether or not they have a, a mental health disorder. Uh, that, that's a big thing, you know, because the funding for, for addiction services is always is way underfunded. And But as you know, then there's a lot of movement also toward, uh, in a sense, compelling or coercing people who, especially those on the street with addiction issues, you know, coercing them into treatment. Um, and yet the capacity for treatment in this state is just, uh, I mean, we just don't have enough capacity for everyone, you know, to be treated. So the question is, um, since much of the burden for treatment is falling on the public system, do you see any political will to force the uh, health plans, health insurance plans, to do more in terms of covering uh, mental health and, and substance use disorder, because they're notorious for, you know, for pr denials of service or restrictions on, on uh, treatment uh, for mental health and substance use disorder. 
and yet they have a, obviously a very influential lobby that lobbies you know, against bills that would require them to do any more. Do you see anything that might be changing? Not around on? that. I, I admit like that is not my specific area of expertise, um, but I haven't heard anything around expanding the requirements. Like, like most recently, you know, there's been expansions around more like procedures, like requiring insurance plans to cover abortion care or um, I think infertility treatment, things like that. Um, I have not heard anything around um, substance use or mental health, but I am also not our specialized uh, you know, healthcare reporters. So I do apologize for that. Uh, you know, to your point, um, you know, we didn't get into all the details of the measure, but you're right. It, there's this bond aspect that's about building more beds, building out the capacity for treatment. And then there's using some of this money from the millionaire's tax to sort of fund those ongoing services. And I think that speaks to the fact that ultimately the state we're in California, we're very much a state that likes to do things through the public route, through the government. And as you can see, the governor's solution is sort of, okay, we're going to put more money into it and try and do it ourselves. So I wouldn't say that the conversation is really one about what's happening through the private sector. Yeah. Back. Good evening. Kind of going back to the beginning when we were talking about the budget deficit. A couple years ago when there was a surplus, Governor Newsom was very quick to take credit for that. It's kind of crickets at this point in terms of taking credit for the deficit. Now, there's a lot of factors. Nobody wants to take it. To, nobody now, wants to own that, right? Can't really blame him, but uh, there's a lot of factors that go into that deficit, as you talked about. Has there been any data to show? I mean, anecdotally, we hear a lot about very high net worth folks getting the heck out of California. Businesses are still here, but their residents are Nevada, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, somewhere else where there's a much lower tax bracket. Has there been any data to see the number of high net worth taxpayers today versus there were a few years ago? There actually has. Um, I could not, I, I have seen those studies because this is the perpetual question. I wish I could tell you exactly who, who has done it. Um, Having red state, blue state yes, flashbacks yes. from books. Um, so, you know, perhaps we can connect after. But I think I think what you generally see is actually the people who are leaving California, and there is obviously that net migration out of California um, to other states. It's actually lower income people who are who are more likely to leave because of the high cost of living. That's who is really being forced out. So, um, you know, the higher income. Uh, the higher income Californians, I mean, they may grumble about the tax levels, but they can ultimately afford it and they generally will stay. Um, but it's a lot of retirees, a lot of poor people who are moving to places like Nevada, Idaho, Arizona, actually, and, and Texas, but generally closer. It's not even necessarily a political statement. Florida, for example, is not a place that a lot of Californians are moving right now. It's, it's really about um, more the cost of living taxes, housing, all these things they just can't afford. And so they're moving to these cheaper states nearby that like Oregon doesn't have an income tax, I believe. So yeah, um, that's generally what the data has showed. Uh, thank you. Um, given the substantial budget shortfall that we discussed towards the beginning um, and the we have new legislative fiscal committee chairs, um, do you foresee the legislative fiscal committees having a, sort of a, a more outsized role this year uh, in determining policy, um, uh, not in the sense that they determine in policy, but not advancing bills forward? Uh, or do you foresee kind of business as usual for the legislative fiscal committees? Uh, by which you mean like appropriations or also budget or? Yeah, I mean, I, it's funny. It's like that is, you know, one of the most powerful roles you can have. And yet, I don't know that that's probably a fun place to be next year. You're probably going to have to kill a lot of your friends' bills. Like, it's just the reality. Um, so I would imagine that is the case. Um, you know, we're obviously a little bit early. The, the, um, the assembly has just changed all its chairs. And we're likely to see 
um, more changes in the Senate in the spring because there's going to be a new uh, Senate leader there. Um, Tony Atkins is handing over the reins to Mike McGuire in February, which isn't something we discussed, but um, that is coming as well. So actually, it's going to be quite a transitional year for the legislature. Um, and, you know, they're going to have to make their mark and sort of set their priorities against this really uh, uncomfortable backdrop of, of this deficit. You know, they're not going to get a year or two to find their feet and, you know, and, and make their impact in, in maybe a, a more positive way that they'd like to. So, um, yeah, there's probably going to be a lot of hard discussions happening behind the scenes. And I think if, you know, if they're thinking in, in political and PR ways, um, people are probably just not going to introduce a lot of that stuff that they, they know is going to get killed because it's probably a waste of a bill. Uh, people may want to make that statement and introduce it anyway, but you know, if, if you're realistically looking at what you can get done next year, you're probably going to be looking at stuff that just doesn't cost money or as much money. Front here. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I'll pass it to you next, Jim. <laughs> pass the mic, yes. Good evening. Uh, a few weeks ago, California, well, specifically the city, hosted the APEC conference, which was an opportunity for California to demonstrate its partnerships with Asian Pacific con uh, countries. And then just this past week, there was the COP28 conference. I was wondering if you're hearing any rumblings from legislators or the administration about any initiatives that they plan to pursue uh, as a result of these, these discussions. Uh, bills and things like that. In, in policies, bills. You know, you know, California likes to be a leader on climate issues. So I was just yeah. Kind of curious. Well, I know we did have a delegation at the COP um, at the COP conference. Um, it was mostly, I think, legislators. I think even um, Robert Rivas went. Uh, I believe the Assembly Speaker, if I remember correctly. So I, I would expect there will be um, stuff that comes out of that that we'll see. You know the. Uh, we're in a weird moment. It's it's the session, uh, the recess in between sessions. So the actual, you know, flurry of bills will probably start coming in January. But um, certainly, I would expect. Uh, you know, last year was actually a very interesting year on on um, or this past year, I should say, on, on climate legislation. Uh, in the absence of the ability for the Biden administration to do a lot of stuff at the federal level there are members of the legislature that are trying to step in and sort of force the conversation along on things like business disclosure of um, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. That was a big bill this, that passed this past year. So, you know, people who have the climate and the environment as a priority, they're always looking for sort of first in the nation stuff they can do. And I'm sure they came back from COP with some ideas around stuff for this next year. Thank you. A couple questions. Um, one, you mentioned you did reference the leadership changes in both the Assembly and the Senate. I'm just wondering if, you know, obviously the budget's probably going to dominate and be the big change, but is there anything, uh, any other changes you see resulting from that change in personality almost is, is one question. I think, I think you should probably speak to the representation stuff a, a little bit, but I think, you know, Always every, you know, every leader in the legislature always has their their approach, whether it be more hands-on, more hands-off. You, you know, you are, I mean, it's essentially an internal popularity contest, right? And in order to stay in power, you have to keep your constituents happy, which in this case is the members of your caucus. So, you know, they're going to be finding their footing um, by, you know, what leadership looks like to them that keeps their caucus satisfied with them and keeps them in power. Um, you know, in the past, we've obviously seen, obviously seen uh, you know, Anthony Rendon very notably took a step back and allowed members to have more power as committee chairs because they were coming out of an era of more strict control from John Perez, for example. Um, so a lot of these things happen in reaction to, uh, you know, the prior... Um, you know, the prior leadership. And um, with Robert Rivas, I mean, that will emerge over time. I think having all this change in, in the committee chairs is certainly, you know, sends a signal of really, you know, shaking things up and having kind of a new era after a very contentious speakership fight. 
Um, the Senate will be interesting to watch because uh, Mike McGuire was was essentially the deputy under Tony Atkins for the last couple of years. He was, you know, the the majority leader. And so it's a little bit more of a continuity feeling, I think, and I'm not sure if we'll see as radical of a shift. Very possible we will, but um, so that that will be an interesting thing to watch as well. Um, in I terms think, of yeah, one of the other things we heard about was the geographic diversity, um, the shifts from, you know, Rendon was from Lakewood, Rivas is from the Central Valley, um, um, Isaac Byron is from LA, Algria Curry is from Davis. So how does that change, you know, um, does it change uh, drought policies, water policies, the sort of urban centric um, focuses of legislation to more rural areas? Um, uh, so I, and Mike McGuire also from a more rural area as well. So that that's, you know, I think both of them have promised to like bring that perspective and try and focus on some of these issues like the wildfire insurance problem, like water, you know, things that maybe haven't gotten as much attention because the leadership isn't as focused on them. We have time for one more question. And I ask because I have continued to ask this and not received a response. Um, we haven't heard it tonight, but is the topic of COVID history? And I bring it up because I hear the Middle East death, horrible accidents, tens of thousands, fentanyl. 145 deaths per day, that's 50,000 deaths in a year. COVID, a million plus. If I understand my research, the origin of it has been defined. Is that origin not liable? Well, so I guess I would say in terms of what the state can do, because I think a lot of this, you know, is also a federal conversation that's not happening anymore. And I think that has sort of set, you know, the, the lack of interest from the federal government to do anything around COVID anymore is probably kind of setting uh, a model for everybody else. But in terms of the state, I would actually expect this conversation to come back in the fall because we are gonna have this ballot measure, which would put a tax on the wealthiest Californians to fund um, preparation for a future pandemic. So I think that you will see a lot of discussion, um, you know, around the fall probably in that campaign around, did we handle COVID well? Did we handle it poorly? Did, you know, what would we do differently in the future? Um, I think also, COVID will continue to be used as a political cudgel. I mean, if you watched that debate between Newsom and DeSantis, and I'm so sorry if you did, um, <laughs> that was one of the questions, right? It was kind of which state handled it better. So I think everybody's still sorting through all of that. Who got it right? Who got it wrong? How should we fix it for the future? How could we do it better? And California will actually have a venue to have that debate via the campaign around that ballot initiative. Did you want to add? Yeah, um, I, I do remember a kind of a specific like turning point. I was at the California Republican Party convention in 2022 ahead of the 2022 election. And I remember talking to candidates about whether, you know, that was still an issue that they were bringing up in their campaigns. And, um, you know, the the campaign logic I heard again and again was it's kind of a, you know, how, how well did California handle it? These uh, like masking issues that people were, you know, mandates, vaccine mandates that people were really frustrated with. Um, that was sort of a losing battle at that point. Um, so I, to me, that was like a turning point of that conversation where we're, we're not going to um, talk about this as prominently as we were in 2021. Yeah. 
So I've got to wrap us up because we have folks who are online and we want to be respectful of their time. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, I mentioned earlier that Cal Matters is a nonpartisan, nonprofit news organization. We provide free stories. All of our coverage is online at calmatters.org. We also provide coverage to more than 280 news organizations across the state so that they can be better informed about our state. So we're nonprofit. We believe that getting out good educational information shouldn't come at a cost to those who can't afford it. So if you can help us in any way, shape, or form, we are having a membership drive right now. We would appreciate your support. Support can come in any way in which you can support us, including signing up for our newsletter. So those of you who are online, you can see we have a QR code. Those of you who are here, we've got a QR code, and that gets you to our daily What Matters, so you can stay informed on what's happening across the state via our reporters and also um, some of the best reporting from others uh, and other news organizations. So thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate your support. We appreciate you guys helping us close out the year with our very last uh, event. Thank you.